How's it going, everyone? Today, we're going to be talking about gluconeogenesis and everything you're going to need to know for your MCAT exam. So first, we have to understand what it actually is. Gluco refers to glucose, which is our monosaccharide. Neo means new, and genesis means to create. So basically, it's as simple as we're creating new glucose, especially glucose that's going to be found in the blood. And we have to ask ourselves, and this is probably the most high yield thing for the MCAT is conceptually, they want you to understand, is this occurring in the fed or fasting state? And you should ask yourself, in what conditions would we want to increase our blood sugar or increase the amount of glucose that we have in our blood? And that's of course gonna be in the fasting state. So gluconeogenesis occurs when we haven't eaten for a while, especially after we've depleted our existing glycogen stores in the liver. Which brings me to my next point, where in the body is this occurring? This is gonna occur in our liver. The liver is a very self-sacrificial organ, a very selfless organ that likes to give things to the rest of the body. Glucose is no exception here. Next, substrates. This is a little bit lower yield, but something they could ask you a difficult question on and could help raise your score, especially if you're one of those high scores looking to get 100th percentile instead of 95th percentile or what have you. So one of those is going to be lactate that we're gonna get when we're running anaerobic glycolysis in the absence of oxygen. Second, you can have something like glycerol 3-phosphate. That's gonna be part of the backbone of triglycerides that we have in our body. And then third, something we don't commonly think about as much is glucogenic amino acids. So glucogenic, as the name would suggest, means that these help make glucose for us. And then we have to think about regulatory hormones. This ties in a lot to the fed or fasting state. So if we think about glucagon, which is produced by the alpha cells of our pancreas, that's of course going to increase the amount of gluconeogenesis that we have. And that should make sense because we release glucagon under fasting conditions when we want to raise our blood sugar when we're not getting that sugar in our blood that's coming from our intestines that's being readily absorbed. Conversely, insulin, which is released by our beta cells of our pancreas, is going to downregulate gluconeogenesis, and that should make sense because that is going to occur in our fed state when we want to decrease our blood sugar, which has been elevated by the food that we're eating, and that food that we ate is being absorbed into the blood from our intestines. This brings us to the biochemical pathway of gluconeogenesis. And really, this is going to be the second highest yield thing that we're going to think of after the fed versus fasting state conceptual process. So in terms of the biochemical pathway, it might be most useful to think about it in terms of running everything in reverse. Well, what in reverse? That would be glycolysis. And glycolysis literally means lysis of glucose, where we're splitting glucose into two pyruvate molecules. And for the most part, running everything in reverse makes a lot of sense, except for there are three more finicky enzymes that are not going to want to run in reverse. They're irreversible enzymes in this process and also happen to be rate limiting largely for this reason. The first one that is going to be irreversible in glycolysis is glucokinase. And notice that I'm saying glucokinase and not hexokinase, because glucokinase is a specific type of hexokinase that we're going to have in the liver. And that concept, the difference between glucokinase and hexokinase is important, but won't be covered in this video. Next will be the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1, or PFK1. And the final one will be pyruvate kinase. This is the final enzyme in our glycolysis pathway that's actually going to create our pyruvate that we created from glucose. So then that begs the question, what enzymes are we going to use to circumvent these irreversible pathways? And this is really high yield because these are great one-off test questions that they could potentially ask you. So to circumvent glucokinase, if a kinase is adding on a phosphate, we want to remove a phosphate. And the enzyme named generally for that is a phosphatase. So we're going to use something called glucose 6-phosphatase. And this enzyme, sometimes I like to test this, is found in the endoplasmic reticulum. So we'll just put that there. Generally, it's a 
pretty specific enzyme to the liver. For PFK1, again, this is a kinase, so we want to take off a phosphate, and that's gonna be another phosphatase. So this will be fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. And then third, pyruvate kinase, this is where it gets a little trickier. Because pyruvate kinase um, is an irreversible step, just at the end of glycolysis, we're gonna need to be a little fancier. We actually take pyruvate inside the matrix of the mitochondrion, where we find pyruvate carboxylase that will actually carboxylate pyruvate into oxaloacetate. That oxaloacetate will be converted to another molecule exported back out to the cytoplasm where phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxykinase will help us go all the way back upstream from pyruvate all the way back to phosphoenyl pyruvate. So these concepts right here, these irreversible enzymes that are also rate limiting in glycolysis, have these complementary enzymes that are going to help circumvent the fact that they are irreversible enzymes. Finally, it's always important to think about this visually in terms of what the biochemical pathway actually looks like. So here I've drawn our pathway, starting with glucose coming from outside of the cell, being brought inside the cell, and being trapped inside the cell, of course, by our glucokinase, which is gonna be fairly specific to the liver. And a kinase will add a phosphate, so we get glucose 6-phosphate. And now it's time to quiz yourself. What is the enzyme that's going to take this process in reverse from glucose 6-phosphate back to glucose? And that is going to be glucose 6-phosphatase. And the organelle that that's going to be found on with inside the cell is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Next, glucose 6-phosphate will be converted via an isomerase to fructose 6-phosphate. Then fructose 6-phosphate will be converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Then we have to ask ourselves, what enzyme is going to help this run in reverse? And that's going to be another phosphatase. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So remember, a kinase adds a phosphate. A phosphatase takes off a phosphate. Then we have a whole lot of different reactions, which finally bring us to the last enzyme in glycolysis, which is pyruvate kinase, which will take phosphoenyl pyruvate into pyruvate. Now, because this um, is a little more complicated because pyruvate actually goes into the mitochondrion as well, we actually have two enzymes that are gonna help bypass this irreversible step of pyruvate kinase. The first is the only one that's going to be in the matrix of the mitochondrion, and that's a potential test question for you. So that's gonna be pyruvate carboxylase. And if they wanted to ask you kind of a mean hard question, the coenzyme for that would be vitamin B7 or biotin. That's gonna be tested a little bit more in medical school, but that is something they could potentially ask you and be converted into oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate will be shuttled out of the mitochondrion, and there is a couple of different steps in that pathway, but we won't go over I don't think there is high yield for you to know on your exam. And oxaloacetate will be converted back into phosphoenolpyruvate by our enzyme PEP, or phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase. So as the name would suggest, we're adding a couple of different things on here and one of those is gonna be a phosphate. And interestingly, most of the time we're gonna be using ATP when we're adding a phosphate. PEP carboxykinase actually uses GTP, and that will be converted to GDP to contribute to the phosphate group on phosphoenopyruvate. So that's another potential question they could ask you. But really knowing well this entire pathway and simply knowing glycolysis really well is gonna help you know gluconeogenesis very well. All right, let's jump into some practice questions. And if you guys are liking this video, please feel free to leave a like and subscribe. It really means a lot to me. So go ahead and pause this video and then we'll go over the questions.
So the first question here, we have this runner completing an ultra marathon. Obviously we're using a lot of energy here and a lot of that is gonna be in the form of glucose. We're gonna be using a lot of glucose to run through the process of glycolysis, which lyses glucose into two pyruvate molecules. And those are gonna be run through the Krebs cycle to make NADH, which is gonna supply electrons for our electron transport chain to ultimately make ATP that our muscles are gonna use. But this person has forgotten their glucose gels, okay, their sugar gels. And around four hours into the race, they likely have depleted their endogenous stores of glycogen, partly in their skeletal muscle, which the muscle itself uses, but also in their liver, okay? So inside the liver, we've depleted a lot of our glycogen stores and we haven't really been able to replace them. So gluconeogenesis is likely going to be upregulated. So then we have to ask ourselves, where is this gluconeogenesis gonna be upregulated? Is it gonna be in the hepatocytes or the skeletal muscle? So remember, hepatocytes is just a fancy way to say liver cell. So that's gonna be our best answer. So remember, the liver is gonna be the predominant site of gluconeogenesis, again, being that very selfless, self-sacrificial um, organ that's producing glucose for the rest of the body to use, namely the skeletal muscle here. So D is also a tempting answer, gluconeogenesis in the skeletal muscle. And that's not gonna be correct because skeletal muscle doesn't really have the capacity to um, perform gluconeogenesis. And part of the reason for that is it actually doesn't have that glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme in the rough endoplasmic reticulum in the same way that the liver does. So let's take a look at some of these other wrong answers here. So A, glycogenesis. That's gonna be the process of building up our glycogen stores. So if we don't have a lot of glucose already, we don't have a lot of money to put in the bank per se, we're not going to be wanting to make more deposits. We're gonna be wanting to withdraw money. So glycogenesis will not be correct. That would be kind of more under the fed state or um, state where we're releasing insulin from the beta islet cells of the pancreas. Same thing with fatty acid synthesis. Another way to say this would be lipogenesis. That would be more in the fed state as well. We're re releasing insulin along with protein synthesis. We don't wanna be building up our muscles necessarily while we're running and expending energy. And then this follow-up question, which of the following would most likely be utilized as a substrate for gluconeogenesis in this runner? So this runner is likely using up a lot of that glucose and running it through glycolysis. And even though they're probably doing largely aerobic exercise, there's gonna be some cells that are probably a little bit oxygen starved and creating lactate. So remember when we go through uh, the process of glycolysis, we create pyruvate. And if we don't have oxygen as that final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, we start shunting a little bit of this pyruvate over to lactate. Part of the reason we do that is that process will convert NADH to NAD+, and that NAD+, goes back to help drive forward the process of anaerobic glycolysis by Le Chatelier's principle. And if this isn't making sense, that's all right. But basically, we just want to think about, you know, a lactic acidosis in a runner who's expending a lot of energy. So lactate is really gonna be our best answer. And you might be thinking, wait, didn't we talk about glycerol 3-phosphate being also an acceptable answer here? So that's true. However, because this runner is expending a lot of energy, glycerol is gonna be a less likely answer than lactate in this person who's actively running and expending a lot of energy. But glycerol would be probably our second best choice. Palmitate, that's a 16 carbon fatty acid that's going to be used primarily when we're thinking about the um, process of fatty acid synthesis. That's going to be our end product and is going to be eventually incorporated into triglycerides. Citrate, that's um, a substrate of the Krebs cycle, which isn't going to necessarily be a substrate for gluconeogenesis. And lysine is an amino acid that's purely ketogenic. So it's useful for making ketones um, or acetyl coenzyme A, but not so much for making glucose.